Welcome back. So, I discovered this op-ed over the Princeton newspaper, which claims that having an honor code at Princeton somehow targets racial minorities. Uh, yeah, they, they, they said that and they went there. So this seems like something that we should talk about. Okay, so let's go take a look. I'm not making this up. See, Princeton's criminal justice inspired honor code hurts fully students. You're not, probably not supposed to pronounce it fully. We're going with it. By that they mean first generation low income, which we'll get to. We'll get to. All right, I, I went ahead and made some highlights throughout this so that I don't waste your time. We can get to the important stuff. All right, so here we go. American systems of legal administration enact violence against minority populations. Examining and reconsidering these structures, such as the criminal justice system, is a crucial part of anti-racist action. Black and African American men make up 13.6% of the population, yet 38.4% of the prison population in the United States. She's so going to go out on a limb here and say, maybe that's because they're committing the crimes. Um, you know, just just... Obviously. Disparity in numbers does not automatically equal oppression. There are alternate reasons why we don't have more female construction workers. You know, it's not because of massive, um, <laughs> a massive conspiracy on the part of male construction workers to keep females out. That's not what's going on, okay? Uh, similarly, the number of people in prison more or less correlates to the number of people who are committing crimes. That's just the way that it is. There are multiple theories for why that happens, there are multiple obvious reasons for why that happens, but the fact that it happens is, is just pretty straightforward, you know. Yes, black men create, or commit, sorry, more crimes than white men. That just is the way that it is. Alright, let's return to this, to this piece. As it goes on, discrimination on the basis of race and wealth are not only written into American laws and constitutions, but also permeate small-scale systems that model the criminal justice system. Now, that's just false. Discrimination on the base of race and wealth are written into American laws? No. No, there aren't um, any modern American laws that say if you're black or if you're poor, then X and Y has to happen to you and you have to get it worse than somebody who's white and rich. It's not written into anything. And you would think that somebody at Princeton would kind of know that. Uh, anyway, continuing, Princeton's honor code tasks with holding students accountable and honest in academic settings mirrors the criminal justice system in its rules and effects. Well, yes, to the degree that it mirrors an idealistic system of criminal justice, because a system that holds students accountable and honest would be what we desire. Right? That's what we desire from the criminal justice system. It may not always be that way. Sometimes it's not. I grant that. I, I, I grant that there's, there are injustices within our system. Certainly within individual cases, things go wrong. But the ideal criminal justice system would hold people accountable and honest. That's a feature. But not according to this person who thinks that that is the problem. And this is the part that's kind of a little bit mind-boggling. It's like, well, uh... <laughs> I'm not sure where else you'd want to be, but all right. Um, continuing down. The university should lead by example by dismantling the honor code system, which acts as a barrier to social mobility and a more equitable society. Now. <laughs> so, we should eliminate the honor code system, which does things like, you know, prohibit cheating. Um prohibit acts of violence on campus, that kind of stuff. Pretty obvious. Um, we should eliminate it because it's similar to the criminal justice system when the criminal justice system also prohibits those things. When the criminal justice system also acts to uh, discourage or punish different types of dishonesty. When the criminal justice system acts to discourage and punish certain acts of, of violence and aggression. Um, now, so this person who is at Princeton thinks we should presumably abolish the criminal justice system because she is advocating for the abolition of a an honor code at all at a university because it, it, it harms people who are violating the honor code. <laughs> it, it's kind of difficult to even get into her head fully and, and realize just how kind of messed up this logic is. We're going to continue. Let's go down here. 
When caught up in the honor code system, flea students may not have institutional knowledge on how to navigate such a process in the same way their white and wealthier counterparts might. Now let's just hold up. <laughs> I'm not the one sitting here assuming that a black person at Princeton is unable to read. But that is what she is assuming. That the black person who is at Princeton is unable to read an honor code, follow an honor code, and then, if caught up in the honor code system, read the rules of it and how it applies and properly contest in the, their trial system. That's actually her argument, which <laughs> seems a little, a little bit prejudiced, I'm just gonna say. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of outlandishly offensive. Like, if I was a, if I was a black guy at Princeton reading this, I'd be seriously offended. You know, like, like some of those pieces that I've read before about how women ought to get preferential treatment because, um, you know, we're, we're just kind of not that capable of, of speaking for ourselves. Um, you often see that by feminists, by the way, which is, is really oddly ironic, uh, thing. But you also see it with, with these people. So, uh, I'm, we're gonna keep on going. The process of reporting and investigating an honor code breach parallels the criminal justice system by mimicking processes of questioning, evidence gathering, witness depositions, and an eventual move to trial or hearing. Okay. Okay. Notice that there's no description of why any of those things is wrong. Now, like, if she wanted to talk about a specific type of injustice that happens, in our criminal justice system, and then correct this particular part that is is mimicked. This no, I, I grant again that there are some things that are not perfect in our criminal justice system, of course. However, her critique is the whole thing is bad, and that evidence gathering is bad. That what was it? Yeah, witness depositions are bad. That the process of questioning is bad. That having a trial is bad. And yeah, these are things that our society kind of is, in some sense, hinged upon to the degree that we, we like having a, a justice system and we aim to have it be fair and we aim to have an investigatory process and then we aim to evaluate those with a jury. <laughs> um, the, these are considered to be sort of um, part of what has made the West different and better, not what is not what's perverse about it. What would be perverse is eliminating that entire process and forcing people to be victims without giving them a type of restitution, without doing anything against their attackers. <laughs> that would be uh, wrong and something we should do away with and something that we should reform. But what she's, what she's like, you know, picking on and choosing is the entire criminal justice process. And I find that, you know, kind of, kind of horrifying in a sense. But I do think this is, in, in general, the way that that we're going, and by we, I just kind of mean in the sense of our, our system of academia, which rules the, the culture to the degree that we have a culture uh, today, because academia is the one that's teaching these students um, their, their non-principles or their anti-principles, and coming out with stuff like, well, we don't need a justice system at all, and that there's a, there's a problem with, with investigations, and there's a problem with trials, and without pointing out what the problem is. And so we end up having these conversations later on outside of colleges where it's like, well, well, maybe we should just get rid of the whole bail system because we don't like it without proposing anything else in its place. Like, okay, you know, um, if you don't like the bail system because it seems to give a preference to people with more money, okay, well, what's your solution? Well, just let everybody go. <laughs> and then we end up with people just going repeatedly into, in and out um, of jails, committing crimes, creating more victims. And there's never said to be an immorality in that. Because that's the thing, right? They're creating new victims via their attempt at creating something that they think is just. Like, if they think it's unjust, uh, unjust rather, to have a, a cash bail system, then okay. And so they eliminate that entirely. And then here we sit with the, the obvious injustice of the creation of new victims of the violence of these people that are being repeatedly released. And I bring all this up because I think there's a real problem with um, a failure on the part of 
I can say myself and my colleagues, that people on the right, you might say, to make the moral arguments, to sort of point out just how absurd and how immoral the actions of people like her are. The, when, when those policies are instituted, just how the real victims are created, real people have to live at the consequence of this kind of perverse thought process, which it is. If you enjoyed that video, please don't forget to like it. Also, I have other videos that you might enjoy. I have links in the description down below as to how you can support this work. So thank you so much.